that doesn't hurt me. For more than a century, March the 8th has been International Women's Day, an opportunity for the world to shine a light on the fight for gender equality while celebrating the innumerable achievements of women. In the years since Letters Live began, talented performers have been breathing life into countless pieces of correspondence fit for such a day. Letters overflowing with wisdom, love, humour and fury these are some of our favourites. In 2017, having recently watched the coming-of-age tale Lady Bird, British film journalist Hannah Woodhead was inspired to write a letter to her mother. On International Women's Day 2018 at Union Chapel, it was read by me, Louise Braley. <laughs> Dear Mum, there's not an awful lot I remember about our relationship during the 2005-2010 period, but I think that's largely because there's not a lot I remember about that time full stop. I hated being a teenage girl. I didn't go to school, I didn't eat, I didn't sleep. It was, all things considered, a bad time. We both know that I've gone to great lengths to forget the unique brand of hormonal malaise and indentured depression which overshadowed that period. I tried everything I could to think of to shrug off that burden from my back, but I always found it barreling straight back down the metaphorical hill of life to crush me all over again. You used to tell me it gets easier, and I'd scream, when? In time, I got so used to its weight that I'd forget I was carrying it at all. I started to say, something's wrong with me, forgetting that A, I was a teenage girl, so intrinsically there was stormy weather constantly on the horizon, and B, a chemical imbalance is not a character flaw. That doesn't mean it hurts any less, of course, as it hurt when Dad walked out, as it hurt when we were broke, as it hurt when I thought I'd be stuck in the town I hated forever. I still don't buy the idea there's nothing wrong with me, but I'm slowly coming to terms with the notion that it's the wrong bits which make people interesting in the first place. I spent many years in the curious adolescent limbo of simultaneously wanting to be both extraordinary and ordinary. I was frustrated that no one got me, I think that's why I turned to films, the natural medium of the outsider. When I think about being a teenager, I think about hurting, but I also think about other things. I think about listening to Radio 2 in the car when you drove me to psychiatric appointments. I think about the numerous times that you came to pick me up because I'd passed out at someone's house party, which you didn't know I was at in the first place, sorry about that like going to the library on a, on a Friday afternoon to rent a DVD for the weekend. I realised later that you weren't watching because you loved movies. You don't. You were watching them because you loved spending time with me. You always believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. And you always said, I have to, I'm your mum. As if a sense of duty is all that compels a person to act so selflessly. And you really were selfless, because we didn't have much, and I know everything you had you gave to me. I'm exhausting. I'm not easy to love, and when I made it especially difficult, you never stopped trying, even when I was being a little shit, which I suspect was most of the time. We both know it's not always easy. It's never going to be easy. But thank you for teaching me that if you keep going, Eventually, you might be able to laugh about things. And in the end, laughing about our mortality and marvelling at what tiny, insignificant specks of stardust we really are is the best any of us can really hope for. And I'm happy with that. Love from your petulant, troublesome, troubled, and eternally grateful eldest daughter, Hannah. <laughs> In 2013, West African singer and activist Angelique Kidjo 
wrote a letter of advice to all girls of the world that was read at the Women of the World Festival in 2020 by Adjua Aboa. Dear girls of the world, I was 12 years old living in the centre of Kotonu Benin in West Africa. Music was all around us with the traditional singers and their drums and with the radio blasting songs from the entire world. Singing had always been my passion. My mum even told me I sung before I spoke. One day, I discovered an uplifting song that made everyone dance. It was called Pata Pata. The power and the beauty of the voice singing in it, I had to get the 45 RPM single right away. That's when I first heard the name of Miriam Makiba, the famous South African singer. I also learned her struggle against apartheid and her success all over the planet. Even though at home, I could see the respect that my father had for my mum, I could feel the world was unbalanced and that it was so hard for girls and women to succeed. Many of my girlfriends at school were dropping out at an early age as the social pressure was huge. Most of them could not choose their own destiny. It was as if they could always be the daughter, the wife, or the mother of someone. But looking at Miriam's smile on the cover, her confidence and the respect she inspired, I started to dream. If an exiled African woman born from a poor family had been able to accomplish so much, there might be a little chance for me to follow in her footsteps. Lost in my thoughts, lying on my bed, listening to her music for hours, learning by heart the lyrics of all her songs, in my imagination I was already traveling with her, singing with her, meeting world leaders and advocating with her for the freedom of her people. That dream has never left me. I grew up and I experienced much rejection, many obstacles, but Miriam's voice was always singing in my head. I started to have some success singing on the national radio. One day, on the way back from school, a group of teenagers recognized me and insulted me, calling me a whore because I was a singer. I came back home crying and wanted to give up singing for good. Mama Congo, my maternal grandmother, happened to be home. She asked me why I was crying so much. Once I explained, she gave me a piece of advice that I have never forgotten, and that I want you to remember when you feel your dreams are shattered. She told me, do you want to be a singer? Yes, Grandma. Then you can't let the opinion of other people discourage you. Don't give up on your dreams. Don't allow them to define who you are, or they would have won. Many years passed. I left my country like Miriam had done. I worked hard, listening to constructive critics and ignoring the naysayers, keeping Miriam's songs close to my heart. Then in a different decade, in a different country, the day finally came when I was asked to sing as the opening act of my beloved idol. I couldn't believe it. Please remember, girls, don't let anyone define who you are. In October 2016, shortly after revealing she had been sexually assaulted by Harvey Weinstein, actor and author Rose McGowan published a letter to the industry. It was read at Union Chapel on March 9th in 2018 by Rose McGowan. Dear Hollywood, to the women and men in the entertainment industry who know exactly whom and what I am talking about, I say be brave. Do not work with those you know to be offenders, or you are no better than they. Take a stand. You are culpable for your actions. Stop rewarding sociopaths. Every time you sanction abhorrent behavior, you are aiding and abetting a crime. That makes you no better than the criminal. How many more stories do you have to hear before you do the right thing and stop rewarding men that are predators? 
Why are you so cowardly that you would take the softer, easier way out? I can tell you this. Your soul is a blighted one if you do so. Your personal legacy, the very fabric of your being is at stake. So fight for it. I know you have it in you to be better. I know you have it in you to break free from the bonds of secrecy. So do it. In 1975, having recently read an anti-abortion essay by his friend and fellow writer Claudio Magri, Italian author Italo Calvino wrote him a letter. At the South Bank Centre on March the 8th, 2020, it was read by Jordan Stevens. Paris, 8th of February 1975. Dear Professor Magris, I was very disappointed to read your article, The Deluded. It pained me a lot, not only that you had written it, but above all because you think in this way. Bringing a child into the world makes sense only if this child is wanted consciously and freely by its two parents. If it is not, then it's simply animal and criminal behaviour. A human being becomes a human not through the casual convergence of certain biological conditions, but through an act of will and love on the part of other people. If this is not the case, then humanity becomes, as it is already to a large extent, no more than a rabbit warren. But this is no longer a free-range warren, but a battery one. In the conditions of artificiality in which it lives, with artificial light and chemical feed, only those people, a man and a woman, who are 100% convinced that they possess the moral and physical possibility not only of rearing a child, but of welcoming it as a welcome and beloved presence, have the right to procreate. If this is not the case, they must first of all do everything not to conceive, and if they do conceive, given that the margin for unpredictability continues to be high, abortion is not only a sad necessity, but a highly moral decision to be taken with full freedom of conscience. I do not understand how you can associate abortion with the idea of hedonism or the good life. Abortion is a terrifying thing. In abortion, the person who is massacred physically and morally is the woman. Also, for any man with a conscience, every abortion is a moral ordeal that leaves a mark. But certainly here, the fate of the woman is in such a disproportionate condition of unfairness compared with the man's that every male should bite his tongue three times before speaking about something. Just at the moment when we're trying to make less barbarous a situation for which the woman is truly terrifying, an intellectual uses his authority so that women have to stay in this hell. Let me tell you, you are really irresponsible to say the least. I would not mock the hygienic prophylactic measures so much. Certainly you will never have to undergo a scraping of your womb. But I'd like to see your face if they forced you to an operation in the filth and without any recourse to hospitals under pain of imprisonment. Your integrity of life, vitalism, is to say the least fatuous. For Pasolini to say these things does not surprise me, but I thought that you knew what it costs and what the responsibilities are if you bring other lives into this world. I am sorry that such a radical divergence of opinion on these basic ethical questions has interrupted our friendship. Calvino. In 2013, British journalist and author Catelyn Moran wrote a letter to one of her daughters, explaining at the time... My daughter is about to turn 13 and I've been, and I will be honest here, chain smoking like a bastard recently. And so, in the wee small hours when my lungs feel like there's a small, fat, furious mouse inside them, scratching to get out, I've thought about writing her one of those dead moving, now I've died of cancer, here's my letter of advice for you to consult as you continue on your now tragic and motherless life letters. This is the first draft. I might tweak it a bit later when I've had another fag. Catelyn read it for us on March the 31st, 2015 at London's Freemasons Hall. Dear Lizzie, hello, it's Mummy. I'm dead. Sorry about that. 
I hope the funeral was good. Did Daddy play Don't Stop Me Now by Queen when my coffin went in the cremator? <laughs> I hope everyone sang along and did air guitar as I stipulated and also wore the stick-on Freddie Mercury moustaches as I ordered in the My Funeral Plan document that's been pinned to the fridge since 2008 <laughs> when I had that extremely self-pitying cold. <laughs> Look, here's a couple of things I've learned on the way that you might find useful in the coming years. It's not an exhaustive list, but it's a good start. Also, I've left you loads of life insurance money, so go hog wild on eBay on those second-hand vintage dresses you love. You have always looked beautiful in them. You have always looked beautiful. The main thing is, just try to be nice. You already are. So lovely that I burst, darling. And I want you to hang on to that and never let it go. Keep slowly turning it up like a dimmer switch whenever you can. Just resolve to shine constantly and steadily like a warm lamp in the corner and people will want to move towards you in order to feel happy and read things more clearly. <laughs> you will be bright and constant in a world of dark and flux and this will save you the anxiety of other ultimately less satisfying things like being cool, being more successful than everybody else and being very thin. Second, always remember that, nine times out of ten, you probably aren't having a full-on nervous breakdown. <laughs> you just need a cup of tea and a biscuit. <laughs> you will be amazed how easily and repeatedly you can confuse the two. Get a big biscuit tin. Three. Choose your friends because you feel most like yourself around them, because the jokes are easy and you feel like you're in your best outfit when you're with them, even though you're just in a t-shirt. Never love someone whom you think you need to mend or who makes you feel like you should be mended. There are boys out there who look for shining girls. They will stand next to you and say quiet things in your ear that only you can hear and that will slowly drain all of the joy out of your heart. <laughs> I can see some people have had some of those here. <laughs> the books about vampires are true, baby. You must drive a stake in their hearts and run away. <laughs> Four, stay at peace with your body. While it's healthy, never think of it as a problem or a failure. Pat your legs occasionally and thank them for being able to run. Put your hands on your belly and enjoy how soft and warm you are. Marvel at the brilliant meat clockwork that you are, as I did when you were inside me and I dreamed about you every night. Whenever you can't think of something to say in a conversation, ask people questions instead. Even if you're next to a man who collects pre-1970s screws and bolts, you will probably never have another opportunity to find out so much about pre 1970s screws and bolts. And you never know when it might be useful. This segues into the next tip. Life divides into amazing enjoyable times and appalling experiences that will later make amazing anecdotes. <laughs> However awful you can get through any experience if you imagine yourself in the future telling your friends about it as they scream in disbelief, no, no. <laughs> Even when Jesus was on the cross. <laughs> I bet he was thinking, when I rise in three days, the disciples aren't gonna believe this. Baby, see as many sunrises and sunsets as you can. Run across the road to smell the roses. Always believe that you can change the world, even if it's only a tiny bit, because every tiny bit needed someone who changed it. Think of yourself as a silver rocket. Use loud music as your fuel, books like maps and coordinates for how to get there. 
host extravagantly, love constantly, dance in comfortable shoes, talk to Daddy and Nancy about me every day, <laughs> and never, ever start smoking. It's like buying a fun baby dragon that will grow and eventually burn down your fucking house. <laughs> love, Mummy. As she walked home one evening in April 2015, a young student named Ione Wells was dragged to the ground and sexually assaulted. Shortly afterwards, Ione wrote a letter to her attacker. It was read at Union Chapel on March the 8th, 2018, by Ophelia Loverbond. I cannot address this letter to you because I don't know your name. I only know that you have just been charged with serious sexual assault and prolonged attack of a violent nature. And I have one question. When you were caught on CCTV following me through my own neighbourhood from the tube, when you waited until I was on my own streets to approach me, when you clapped your hand around my face until I could not breathe, when you pushed me to my knees until my face bled, when I wrestled with your hand just enough so that I could scream, when you dragged me by my hair and when you smashed my head against the pavement and told me to stop screaming for help, when my neighbour saw you from her window and shouted at you and you looked at her in the eye and carried on kicking me in the back and neck, when you tore my bra in half from the sheer force you grabbed my breast, when you didn't reach once for my belongings because you wanted my body, when you failed to have my body because all my neighbours and family came out and you saw them face to face, when CCTV caught you running from your attempted assault on me and then following another woman 20 minutes later from the same tube station where you arrested on suspicion. When I was in the police station until 5 a.m., while you were four floors below me in custody, when I had to hand over my clothes and photographs of the marks and cuts on my naked body to forensic teams, did you ever think of the people in your life? I don't know who the people in your life are. I don't know anything about you. But I do know this. You did not just attack me that night. I am a daughter. I am a friend. I am a girlfriend, I am a pupil, I am a cousin, I am a niece, I am a neighbour. I am the employee who served everyone down the road coffee in the cafe under the railway. All the people who form those relations to me make up my community, and you assaulted every single one of them. You violated the truth that I will never cease to fight for, and which all of those people represent that there are infinitely more good people in the world than bad. This letter is not really for you at all, but for all the victims of attempted or perpetrated serious sexual assault and every member of their communities. I'm sure you remember the 7-7 bombings. I'm also sure you remember how terrorists did not win because the whole community of London got back on the tube the next day. You've carried out your attack but now I'm getting back on my tube. My community will not feel we are unsafe walking back home after dark. We will get on the last tube home and we will walk up our streets alone because we will not ingrain or submit to the idea that we are putting ourselves in danger in doing so. We will continue to come together like an army when any member of our community is threatened and this is a fight you will not win. Community is a force we all underestimate. We get our papers every day from the same news agents. We wave to the same woman walking her dog in the park. We sit next to the same commuters each day on the tube. Each individual we know and care about may take up no more than a few seconds of each day, but they make up a huge proportion of our lives. Somebody once told me that however familiar they appear, the faces of our dreams are always faces that we have seen before. Our community is embedded in our psyche. You, my attacker, have not proved any weakness in me or my actions, but only demonstrated the solidarity of humanity. Tomorrow, you find out whether you'll be held in prison until your trial.
because you pleaded not guilty and posed a threat to the community. Tomorrow, I have my life back. As you sit awaiting trial, I hope that you do not just think about what you have done. I hope you think about community, your community. Even if you can't see it around you every day, it is there. It is everywhere. You underestimated mine. Or should I say ours? I could say something along the lines of, imagine if it had been a member of your community. But instead, let me say this. There are no boundaries to community. There are only exceptions. And you are one of them. In 1912, a bacteriologist wrote to the Times and argued that women should not be allowed to vote due to their supposed psychological and physiological deficiencies. Two days later, a reply appeared from one of the doomed. Unbeknownst to all, its sender was Clementine Churchill. At the 10th Women of the World Festival in March 2020, it was read by Daisy Ridley. March 30th, 1912 to the editor of the Times. Sir, after reading Sir Almroth Wright's able and weighty exposition of women as he knows them, the question seems no longer to be, should women have votes, but ought women not to be abolished altogether? <laughs> I have been so much impressed by Sir Almroth Wright's disquisition, backed as it is by so much scientific and personal experience, that I have come to the conclusion that women should be put a stop to. <laughs> we learn from him that in their youth, they are unbalanced, that from time to time they suffer from unreasonableness and hypersensitiveness, and that their presence is distracting and irritating to men in their daily lives and pursuits. If they take up a profession, the indelicacy of their minds makes them undesirable partners for their male colleagues. Later on in life, they are subject to grave and long-continued mental disorders, and if not quite insane, many of them have to be shut up. <laughs> now, this being so, how much happier and better would the world not be if only it could be purged of women? It is here that we look to the great scientists. Is the case really hopeless? Women have no doubt had their uses in the past, else how could this detestable tribe have been tolerated until now. But is it quite certain that they will be indispensable in the future? Cannot science give us some assurance, or at least some ground of hope, that we are on the eve of the greatest discovery of all, i.e. how to maintain a race of males by purely scientific means? <laughs> and may we not look to Sir Almroth Wright to crown his many achievements by delivering mankind from the parasitic, demented, and immoral species which has infested the world for so long. Yours obediently, CSC, one of the doomed. In 1926, leading anthropologist Margaret Mead received a letter from her younger sister Elizabeth, who had recently experienced her first sexual encounter. At London's Freemasons Hall on the 6th of March 2016, Mead's reply was read by Gillian Anderson. Elizabeth, dear, I've a good mind to punish you by writing back in pencil. You're a wretch to write in pencil on pink paper just when you're writing something very important that you particularly want me to read. Don't do it again. I'm glad you told me about the moonlight party, dear. It's the sort of thing that had to happen sometime, and it might have been a great deal worse. <laughs> As it was, it was a nice boy whom you like, and nothing that need worry you. There are two things I'd like to have you remember, or in fact, several. The thrills you get from touching the body of another person are just as good and legitimate thrills as those you get at the opera. <laughs> Only the ones which you get at the opera are all mixed up with your ideas of beauty and music and life, 
and so they seem to you good and holy things. In the same way, the best can only be had from the joys which life offers to our sense of touch, for sex is mostly a matter of the sense of touch, when we associate those joys with love and respect and understanding. All the real tragedies of sex come from disassociation, either of the old maid who sternly refuses to think about sex at all until finally she can think about nothing else and goes crazy, or of the man who goes from one wanton's arm to another seeking only the immediate sensation of the moment and never linking it up with other parts of his life. It is by the way in which sex and under this I include warm demonstrative friendships with both sexes, as well as, as love affairs proper with men, is linked with all the other parts of our lives, with our appreciation of music and tenderness for little children, and most of all, with our love for someone and the additional nearness to them which expression of love gives us, that sex itself is given meaning. You must realize that your body has been given you as an instrument of joy. And though you should choose most rigorously whose touch may make that instrument thrill and sing a thousand beautiful songs, you must never think it wrong of it to sing. For your body was made to sing to another's touch, and the flesh itself is not wise to choose. It is the spirit within the body which must be stern and say, no, you cannot play on this my precious instrument. <laughs> True, it would sing for you. Your fingers are very clever at playing on such instruments. <laughs> but I do not love you nor respect you. And I will not have my body singing a tune which my soul cannot sing also. If you remember this, you will never be filled with disgust of any sort. Any touch may set the delicate chords humming, but it is your right to choose who shall really play a tune, and be very, very sure of your choices first. To have given a kiss where only a handshake was justified by the love behind it, that is likely to leave a bad taste in your mouth. And for the other part, about being boy crazy. Try to think of boys as people, Some nice, some indifferent, not as a class. You aren't girl crazy, are you? Then why should you be boy crazy? If a boy is an interesting person, why like him? If he isn't, don't. Think of him as an individual first and as a boy second. What kind of person he is is a great deal more important than that he belongs to the other sex. After all, so do some hundred million other individuals. I am very proud of the way you are able to think through the problems which life brings you and of the way you meet them. And I consider it a great privilege to have you tell me about them. I'm so glad you are happy, dear. Very lovingly, Margaret. In 1956, Hollywood actor Marlene Dietrich sent a downbeat letter to her friend, Noel Coward, in which she detailed a disastrous fight with her on-off lover of five years, Yule Curly Brinner, just the latest depressing episode of many. On March the 8th, 2020, Coward's reply was read by Shuti Gatwa. Oh, darling. Your letter filled me with such a lot of emotions. The predominant one being rage, that you should allow yourself to be so humiliated and made so unhappy by a situation that really isn't worthy of you. I loathe to think of you apologizing and begging forgiveness and humbling yourself. I don't care if you did behave badly for a brief moment, considering all the devotion and loving you have given out during the last five years, you had perfect right to. The only mistake was not to have behaved a great deal worse a long time ago. The aeroplane journey sounds a nightmare to me. It is difficult for me to wag my finger at you from so very far away, particularly as my heart aches for you. But really, darling, 
You must pack up this nonsensical situation once and for all. It really is beneath your dignity. Not your dignity as a famous artist and a glamorous star, but your dignity as a human, only to human beings. Curly is attractive, beguiling, tender, but there's many men who merit these delightful adjectives. Do please try to work out for yourself a little personal philosophy and do not, repeat, do not be so bloody vulnerable. To hell with goddamned Lamour. It always causes far more trouble than it's worth. Don't run after it. Don't court it. Keep it waiting off stage until you're good and ready for it. And even then, treat it with such suspicious disdain that it deserves. I'm sick to death of you waiting about in empty houses and apartments with your ears strained for the telephone to ring. Snap out of it, girl. A very brilliant writer once said, oh, could it have been me? Life is for living. Well, that is all it is for. And living does not consist of staring into other people's windows and waiting for crumbs to be thrown at you. You've carried on this hole in a corner, overcharged, romantic, unrealistic nonsense long enough. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Other people need you. Stop wasting your time on someone who really only says tender things to you when he's drunk. Unpack your sense of humor and get on with living. Enjoy it. Incidentally, there is one fairly strong-minded type who will never let you down and who loves you very much indeed. Just try and guess who it is. Kiss, 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 kiss. Those are not romantic kisses, those are unromantic. Loving, goose ez. Your devoted Fernando de la Mat. In November of 1943, desperate not to be forced into military service, a father of seven asked his wife to write a letter that would prove that his family needed him at home. The letter that ultimately forced him into battle was read at the Royal Albert Hall on the 3rd of October 2019 by Crystal Clark. November 1943. Draft Board. Poinsett County, Arkansas. Dear United States Army, my husband asked me to write a recommendation telling you that he supports his family. He cannot read, so don't tell him. He ain't no good to me. He ain't done nothing but raise hell and drink lemon essence since I married him eight years ago, and I gotta feed seven kids of his. Maybe you can get him to carry a gun. He's good with squirrels and eating. Take him and welcome. I need the grub and his bed for the kids. Don't tell him this, but just take him and send him as far as you can. <laughs> Mrs. Cassie Murdoch. In June 2016, British writer Sarah Louise Jordan became the latest in an impossibly long line of women to be sent, without so much as a warning, an unsolicited photograph of a penis belonging to a romantic stranger. On International Women's Day in 2020, Sarah's response was read by Olivia Coleman. Hello. <clears throat> Dear Sir, Thank you for the unexpected and unsolicited submission of your penis portrait for our consideration. <laughs> we regret to inform you that it has failed to pass our most basic standards of quality control at this time. <laughs> However, for a nominal fee, we can offer you a report that will help you change that. The A4 report, provided via postal service, will include a personalised booklet that covers the following. Why genitals are not acceptable conversation opener. A step-by-step -step guide to saying hello. <laughs> How to appear as though you weren't raised by wolves. <laughs> Better ways to deal with your sexual frustration. How to dress your penis for social media. <laughs> A rough guide to pants. <laughs> and penis reading a new form of palmistry that may help you unlock the key to your future. 
We will also answer questions you might have, such as, do I have too much time on my hands? <laughs> and why did my penis fail basic standards of quality control? <laughs> Note, the number one reason for this occurring is that it is attached to a bigger dick than itself. <laughs> Finally, as a gesture of goodwill, we intend to offer two free samples with all of your future penis portrait submissions an inventive critique of your pride and joy, and a surprise consultation with your closest available family member about your portfolio. <laughs> we trust this exciting offer is acceptable and look forward to working with you in the near future. Yours faithfully, Sarah Louise. On February 26, 2018, at the Theatre at the Ace Hotel in Los Angeles, Scottish musician and actor Shirley Manson read a letter to her niece. My dear Georgie, I have the time and the inclination. Allow me the privilege of sharing a little secret with you. As you grow older, you will start to notice how boys tell you that you run like a girl or you fight like a girl or that you do all manners of things like a girl as though doing anything like a girl is a bad thing. You will watch movies or television programs or even current news reports that document the devastation that some men experience upon discovering that their partners have given birth to a female baby instead of a boy. As a child, you will not fully comprehend how this kind of information impacts you or your psyche, but you will store it away for future reference. You will begin to notice that the girls the same age as you, girls you go to school with or hang with, at ballet class or karate class, have started to become obsessed with their appearance. It will slowly drive you to begin focusing on your own appearance. You will start to judge yourself harshly. You will evaluate your own face, your weight. You will pit yourself against the most unrealistic of images peddled in the media and expect yourself to attain such dizzying levels of perfection. You will start to believe that perhaps your looks really are more important than anything else in the world because nobody seems to spend half the amount of time focusing on your achievements at school or your artistic endeavours or in being a great friend as they do complimenting you for looking pretty. You will start to notice that even though you were taught by your mother that it is not what you look like, it's who you are as a person that counts, you will secretly begin to harvest the notion that you've been fed a line of complete horseshit. As a young woman, you will start to notice that when your friends get married, they casually toss away their family name without a second's thought, as though it holds no value whatsoever. They will cheerily proceed to take on the mantle of their husband's family name. The subtle and insidious inference here is that his name holds more importance or value than hers. You will start to wonder why your lovely just married young friend is now referred to as a missus. This will appall you because Mrs. is actually an abbreviation of Misters, which in turn is an abbreviation of the phrase belonging to Mr. The subtle, insidious inference here is that women are, ob are objects and they belong to men. So Georgie, my darling, what I'm trying to say here is this. You do everything you damn well choose and carry on doing it just like a girl. Do it like a girl and do it good and damn the person who tells you it's of lesser importance or value than your male counterpart. Worry not that you do things differently from your male friends. See it merely as achieving the same thing, utilizing a different style. Expect to be paid the same as a man for doing the same job. If you're not compensated equally, make a stink. If the stink does not change a thing, call me and we will organize, galvanize, and get all militant on their ass. Fight for your rights, demand equality, seek legal recourse, don't take it sitting down. And above all, my darling Georgie girl, run free, run wild, be who you want to be, be bold, be fearless. You're as good as the next man and don't you ever forget it. Don't waste your life and your energy worrying about your weight or your face. Instead, spend your life learning about all the incredible, wondrous things out there in this big, bright world. Broaden your mind, expand your horizons, 
push limitations and travel as much as possible. Fill your life with good books, excitement, discovery and adventure. All this and more is within your grasp. I know this because I see that light, that spirit, that fight in you, and I know you will grow to recognize it in yourself because you come from a long line of warrior women, from your great-grandmothers, your grandmothers, your formidable mother, your father, who I'm proud to proclaim is also a feminist, your magical brother, and all your aunties, uncles, and cousins. We all have your back, but you will do well to remember, with great power comes great responsibility. Use it well. I love you more than you will ever know. Yours truly, Auntie Shirley. Thank you. On International Women's Day 2018, Roxanne Tatai closed the show with a cover of Kate Bush's Running Up That Hill. Doesn't hurt me. Do you wanna feel how it feels? Do you wanna know that it doesn't hurt me? Do you wanna hear about the deal making? It's you. It's you and me And if only could I make a deal with God And I'll get him to swap our places Be running up that road Be running up that hill Be running up that building So if only could oh, You don't want to hurt me You see how deep the bullet lies I was there tearing you aside thunder in our hearts is there so much hate for the ones we love tell me we both matter don't we too it's you and me it's you and And if only could I make a deal with God And I'll get him to swap all places Be running up that road Be running up that hill Be running up that building So if only could It's you and me It's you and me We won't be unhappy Come on baby Come on now Let me steal this moment from you now Come on angel Come on, come on darling Let's exchange the experience. If only could 
and make a deal with God and I'll get him to swap our places. Be running up that road, be running up the hill with no problems. If only could be running up the hill. If only could be running up that hill. Running up that hill.